And joining us now on the debate for the full edition tonight, in Charlotte, North Carolina, Richard Lawhern, retired military and former chief systems engineer for the U.S. Army. In New York, New York, Michael Higgins, vice president for mission and Catholic identity at Sacred Heart University. In Hamilton, Ontario, Patrick Dean, president and vice chancellor at McMaster University. And with us here in studio, Bonnie Patterson, president and CEO of the Council of Ontario Universities, and Cheryl Misak, Vice President and Provost at the University of Toronto. And it's good to have you two here in our studio and to our friends in Points Beyond. Thank you for joining us tonight for uh, a discussion that uh, a lot of people are having in this province right now. And um, um, before we get to one of our guests, I want to read something that the New York Times published. Uh, this is going back a couple of years, but nevertheless, it sums it up nicely. With an American guest on the program, we thought we'd start with the New York Times. One idea that elite universities like Yale, sprawling public systems like Wisconsin, and smaller private colleges like Lewis and Clark have shared for generations is that a traditional liberal arts education is, by definition, not intended to prepare students for a specific vocation. Rather, the critical thinking, civic and historical knowledge, and ethical reasoning in the humanities develop a different purpose. They are prerequisites for personal growth and participation in a free democracy, regardless of career choice. Okay, that's how Patricia Cohen wrote about it in the New York Times a couple of years ago, and now I want to go around our literal and metaphorical table here and get your views. Uh, Red Lahern, let's start with you. What's the purpose of a university? Well, <clears throat> I think I would differ with the author you just quoted in some rather substantive way, because most students actually go to a university or college to prepare to earn a living. And if that factor in the educational system is ignored, I think we missed the, very largely missed the point of the exercise. Michael Higgins. I, th I think the point um, that she makes needs or requires some uh, distinction or nuancing. I, I would say less the, vo the, the vocation rather than the profession. She uses the word vocation as if it's synonymous with profession. I don't think it is. I think that the, the training we provide, if training is the right word, uh, in a university is largely for the expansion of the mind. Uh, that's a vocation. The vocation to develop uh, reflective uh, individuals who can bring a, through a critical lens, intelligent discernment to complex issues that define and shape a democracy. To that degree, uh, education within our system should be largely vocation specific, not profession specific. Patrick Dean. Well, I think uh, my, my view is that the university exec exists to provide the deepest and most profound preparation for life uh, that it can. I, I, I definitely don't hold the view that we're, we're here to prepare people simply for a career. Um, but we are here, I think, to prepare people for a productive, fruitful contribution to society and to life on our planet beyond the end of their degree. So uh, there is a purpose to it. I think uh, an education, even in uh, the liberal arts, has a purpose, although it, it's not to be construed in an extremely narrow way. Bonnie Patterson. Well, I would say that the author's correct uh, and, and also frames it in a very different way. If you think of the skills coming out of the liberal arts and their relationship to the workplace, whatever that is, there's actually a very solid alignment. Critical thinking, problem solving, kinds of skills the, uh, the author of that quote uh, talks about, they are in fact what employers today are looking, like, uh, looking for and, uh, and it is in fact a, a good employability set of skills for students for the long term. So does that put you closer to Red Lawhern in your view of what universities are for? Well, for, I think they're teaching, learning and research organizations and uh, a big part of it is preparation for life but we serve many, many purposes and the workplace is one of them. Cheryl Misak. All of the above. <laughs> so a, a liberal arts uh, education expands the mind, it makes better citizens, it uh, helps uh, people to think clearly, but also these days a liberal arts education uh, makes people employable in very practical yeah. ways. So, you know, I was just talking to two third year undergraduates in African studies. And next week, they are off to Ethiopia to uh, have some experiential learning, uh, take a look at what's happening with the UN in Ethiopia. This is a part of you know, the University of Toronto liberal arts education these days. Red Lawhorn, let me ask you if you want to reevaluate your answer only insofar as your first answer to us suggested 
that the New York Times excerpt missed the point of what you thought university was all about. And yet one of our other guests has described university as profound preparation for life. In other words, not for work, but for life. You want to go at it again? Life? Yeah, certainly. Um, what I would suggest is that while we can teach critical thinking, and I hope we do better at it than we have historically, but while we can teach critical thinking, if we do not expose students in the post-secondary environment to something that has a domain content, in other words, a knowledge base that is particular to something they can earn a living at, I think we do them a very serious disservice. The example I would call to mind here is one that's, it, that's meaningful in my own family. My, one of my daughters graduated in English from the University of California system, cum laude, about 15 years ago, and discovered that teaching for her was not going to work. With her communication skills, she made a transition in career, but to do it, she had to train herself in information technology, <coughs> excuse me, as an assistant network administrator in various kinds of network organizations for American corporations. Uh, before she left the workplace to have her family, she was an assistant administrator for our Federal Reserve System. There's no way an English degree prepared her to do that. She had to do it all on her own. And what I'm suggesting is that this is not an unusual experience, at least here in the U.S., where you come with a degree and you certainly learn to think critically, but it doesn't prepare you to do the thing that will put bread on your table, and that's a big part of life. Patrick Dean, do you need to reevaluate what you put forward earlier about this being profound preparation for life? Well, uh, as a proud holder of several degrees in English, I, I'm, I'm interested in the story about Richard's daughter very much, of course. Uh, I think uh, what I would say about this is that uh, the kind of uh, learning that one engages in as part of a liberal arts education equips you to deal with the kind of breadth and complexity of problems that uh, you encounter in the workplace. So I suppose, in a way, what I'd say to Richard is that, yes, I recognize that there is always that kind of retooling that is required as, as someone who's been schooled in the arts moves into an engagement with uh, the practical issues of building a career and so on. But I think one is really well equipped to do it because uh, the, the, the breadth of inquiry, the concentration on uh, critical analysis, the u proper use of the language, uh, uh, the analysis of various forms of, of cultural uh, symbols and so on, this is all critical and important in many different walks of life. So I think, uh, yes, uh, human beings coming out of a liberal arts education obviously do need to, to uh, subject themselves to that kind of transition, but I'd argue it's a natural expansion upon what we do uh, in, a, in our studies uh, and proportionately less strenuous than someone who's been educated in a very narrow way who might have to make a radical shift in career. Richard Lawhorn, do you find that at all persuasive? Not in particular, because I've seen too many con uh, con uh, contrary examples, uh, particularly in the graduate school level. Uh, frankly, the question I think has to be posed, um, what does a university education in the liberal arts actually prepare someone to do? Now, we can talk in general terms about uh, critical thinking and communications, but I've in fact had to retrain a good number of liberal arts graduates to be able to communicate effectively in the corporate and industrial environment. I've had to retrain even engineers to be able to write well, and that's another interesting challenge because we're not usually trained very well to do that. But I, I guess I would say that there is a lack of fidelity between what we teach in the liberal arts curriculum and in the engineering curriculum, I might add, but in the liberal, particularly in the liberal arts uh, development, there is a lack of fidelity between what we teach, what we expose our students to, and what we expect of them in a working environment. And at, to ask them to pick it up after they graduate, it seems to me, is a little short-sighted. Cheryl, there was a good question there. What does university actually prepare you to do? You got a good answer? Well, as a PhD in philosophy, oh, I have boy. the distinction Talk of about uh, unemployable. Okay, <laughs> being from going. the most unemployable <laughs> uh, uh, discipline uh, as the urban myth goes. But in fact, uh, my friends in, uh, from graduate school who didn't go on to teach uh, philosophy in a university as I did, 
uh, were very employable. One is making five times my salary in Seattle as a, an a, analysis, uh, 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 doing analysis in insurance uh, company. Uh, Wait a sec, they're a PhD in philosophy? PhD in and philosophy, doing analysis yeah, in and for insurance, insurance companies. Uh, the other runs uh, the whole of the International Baccalaureate uh, Theory of Knowledge program uh, for, the, for the entirety of the IB. So uh, we have philosophers do lots of things other than teach philosophy. Philosophy undergraduates do better on the LSAT than any other uh, kind of major. Uh, many, many careers uh, are opened up okay, uh, for philosophy. You will PhD. forgive the silly question then, but what does a doctorate in philosophy. How does that help you be a better systems analyst for an insurance company? So employers are looking for a set of skills. They're looking for people who can analyze, who can argue properly, who can think clearly, who can write well. And, uh, and these people uh, tend to do very, very well. And you, these, this is all very documentable. Um, so a, a PhD, even in the liberal arts, uh, results if you want to think of it in sheer dollar terms in uh, you know, many uh, millions of dollars more uh, f throughout the course of a career than uh, someone who doesn't have post-secondary education at all. So these things are measurable. There's a lot of data out there. And even uh, undergraduate uh, uh, degrees in English and philosophy uh, pay off. Uh, well, let me find out from Michael Higgins if that's his experience. M Michael Higgins, what do you think a liberal arts education actually prepares you to do? I, I have a slightly more iconoclastic view of it, um, I, in, in a sense, Steve. I, I mean, clearly, what we're talking about is, is uh, multi variegated, and um, liberal arts education is a component of university life, which is a component of post secondary education. So, there are many things we're talking about here that I think are getting perhaps a uh, 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 might confounded. And they're rather different in kind. My, my sense is, and I, 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 it comes from a, uh, a fairly long experience in, in higher education. I was a president of a couple of universities in Canada and uh, have been committed to the liberal arts for my, not in terms of my own career, but in, in terms of the environment that I try to foster. And my sense is that in an important way, um, if, if we look at the degree, and I'm speaking particularly of the humanities and the social sciences here, even distinguishing it further from the liberal arts, but if we look at them in, primarily in terms of the utilitarian value, then I think we get ourselves in the, in the kind of net that, that uh, Richard is talking about, and it's very difficult to extricate ourselves from it. If we look actually at it in slightly different terms of how we uh, shape the mind, of how we educate towards enhanced appreciation of the complexity of issues, I'm often stunned by the fact that m many people of, of who, who have higher education credentials and establish themselves quite seriously in the workplace are still on several fronts rather credulous. And credulousness um, with regard to how systems work, how people think, the value of ideas or propositions. I mean, it's so very easy to be seduced by this, particularly when we live in a multidisciplined and complex society. So educating people to be highly critical, to discern at deeper levels than merely a, a superficial appropriation would allow, being in conversation with an organic and living culture, to understand something about not just one civilization, but something about several civilizations. That kind of generalist background actually serves to guarantee, I think, uh, democracy and indeed the flourishing of an enlightened citizenry. So I, I, I think it's very important, but cannot be weighed in the quantifiable way that you might if you were an employer saying, I need you know seven more people to work in this specific area with a specific skill set. If they're coming out of a classic a humanities and social sciences education, they're going to have an elasticity of mind and an agility of skill that would allow them to pick things up fairly quickly. But that's not the primary purpose for their training. The primary purpose for their training is to make them educated in the broadest sense of that term. Hmm. Bonnie Patterson? Well, I think an undercurrent in the discussion so far, Steve, uh, is what's the expectation of the university? By the uh, student? By, but where, by multiple stakeholders, whether it's employers, students, families, et cetera. And what we, we do know that students that graduate in liberal arts, uh, whether it's humanities, social sciences, in actual fact, uh, w whether they hit the ground running in a particular job right out of graduation or not, might be part of this debate as opposed to how prepared they are for the mid and long term because they know how to learn. 
And certainly job data will demonstrate that even in the height of the recession uh, that we've just gone through and some would argue aren't quite through, uh, the job statistics for students coming out of liberal arts education stand up pretty well, both six months after graduation, well over 92 percent, uh, two years after graduation from 2008, the height of the recession, uh, higher again by two or three percentage points. And then when you ask those students about the relevance of what they've studied to their jobs, over 88 percent of them will say it was relevant to what I'm doing. Okay, I do hear that, but then again, uh, President Dean, I also hear things like, I went to get a liberal arts education, I graduated with this piece of paper, I can't get a job, not only that, my literacy and numeracy, numeracy skills, um, my employer tells me, are not what they ought to be. Th there is a lot of discussion nowadays about whether yeah. the liberal arts education and that degree in particular, you know, as the cliche says, is worth the paper it's printed on. Can you help us with that? Well, I think, Steve, an interesting point that hasn't come up yet is, is the issue of quality. I mean, a, a liberal arts education uh, in one institution under a particular set of circumstances is not necessarily going to be the equal of, of a liberal arts education elsewhere. And presumably, the, a student coming through uh, in uh, um, a course of study in the first institution will fare differently from, uh, from a student coming through the second kind of institution. So I, I, I think, in a way, the, the terms of this debate, uh, liberal arts versus a more targeted career-oriented education, are uh, only superficially helpful in the discussion. I think a more useful point uh, to, to probe is um, what constitutes a first-rate liberal arts education and what might be the benefits for students who are, are uh, um, the product of that education. Uh, because you, you, you've put the same point uh, on the uh, professional side. I mean, I think uh, increasingly engineering schools are looking to include in the curriculum uh, an understanding of culture and society, presumably based on the, the very sensible notion that uh, um, engineering projects will often, of course, have to occur in, embedded in society and in a particular culture wherever, you, wherever they're done. So in the same way that you want to see um, a, a very career-oriented course of study, um, uh, high quality in the sense of being able to be easily applied in many different contexts. Uh, similarly, with a, with a liberal arts education, one would want to think of it not just as uh, the, the study of, let's say, uh, five uh, liberal arts subjects chosen at random, which happen to add up to a degree according to the degree rules. I think uh, we all need to be thinking about uh, what the outcome is that we would want to see uh, as a result of a course of study. And uh, in thinking about that, there's a whole lot that's uh, uh, taken to be received wisdom and absolute truth, but is, in fact, uh, within our ability to alter. So that, uh, you know, if you think backwards from what would an ideal broad uh, mind and a uh, broad range of, of, of competence and understanding be, uh, and then try to sort of work backwards thinking about how you would structure a course of study to bring yourself to that point. That might be a direction to, to follow in thinking about our liberal arts programs and whether they're doing what we want them to do. I think, I mean, I, I would agree with Michael in general about the, the, the power of a, a very, very good liberal arts program. Um, uh, but not every program is very good. Uh, and I think it is time to think uh, carefully about what constitutes quality in all programs of study. Uh, and once, once one gets beyond that discussion, then I think it's possible to think about the generic relationship of a professionalized to a, uh, a so-called uh, general course of study. Yeah, I am not surprised that somebody from Hamilton, Ontario has actually put his finger on what the key issue we should be discussing today is because, of course, people from Hamilton are fantastic. Oh, well indeed. done, Patrick. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and the fact that I'm born there has nothing to do with that last, <laughs> that last thing that I said. But Cheryl, follow up on that if you would. I mean, we, we, th this is a this is an issue, is that people think they've plunked down their money, they've got their piece of paper, never mind what, what is university for, is there any value to what I got? Did I get a quality education to begin with? So I, I think we have to uh, also understand that the landscape of higher education and the landscape of the economy is changing uh, yeah. very rapidly. So this is, you know, to use the overused word, a knowledge economy. 
And uh, it is now starting to become the case that a BA, whether it be in engineering or philosophy, uh, is, is good enough to get you a job. I mean, our, our employment rates are 95% with very little variability between the humanities and the engineering degrees. 95% of what you want or just 95%? So, so exactly. So 95%. And then if you really, really want to do uh, well in life, and this, of course, is a, a gen general statement, doesn't hold for any uh, particular individual, but if you really want to do well, now uh, our students are banging down our doors to get into professional master's programs. We have 83 of them, ranging from museum studies to aerospace engineering to public policy. These are one or two year master's degrees that you do after a BA. Uh, they almost always have an internship component. The employment rates are very, very high afterwards, and, and we place students in fantastic positions. But the liberal arts education is the it's, prerequisite it, to that. It's the, it's the starter. The foundation. It's the foundation. Mm -hmm. So the landscape of, as I say, both uh, the economy but also uh, universities in lockstep, because universities are, in fact, uh, responsive uh, to what uh, our students want and need. Otherwise, we wouldn't already have 83 of these <laughs> in place. Um, so, you know, it's changing, and we need to change with it. I want to do a follow-up with Richard Lawhorn here, because uh, I know you were in the military, and I know that you had an, a career in engineering, but I don't know whether or not in that background there was any time spent uh, getting a liberal arts education. Was there? In the formal sense that you speak to it, no. <coughs> However, in the practical sense of having to broaden the engineering education to add many other subjects, certainly yes, and, and largely on the job. Uh, I'd like to add a comment to the last observations, if I might. Sure. Two, two questions. One being, of those 80-odd professional programs, how many of them require a thesis? And on a different uh, dimension, if you will, how does one measure, or if you will use an over use term metricize quality as an outcome of education because it's all well and good to speak of these things in the abstract but our stakeholders or the stakeholders in the educational system if you will live with the concrete consequence of both issues and there's a and there's a very high degree a very high proportion of programs which uh, require a thesis paper or a dissertation paper worse where an awful lot of people pay tuition but never walk away with a degree and they have nothing to offer other than an all but dissertation or all but thesis uh, academic record and they're at a severe disadvantage and they're also I might add in debt right sometimes in hock up to their eyebrows so the question has to be posed are we getting value for investment, let me. Let I don't. I don't think that question is 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 necessarily, uh, you know, obtuse or unsubtle or or irrelevant. I think it's highly relevant. No, it's a very fair question. But let's say, mm -hmm. I mean, Body Patterson, do we do we measure? Yes, I got a quality education at a liberal arts university because I got a job at the end of the day, or is there a different way of measuring? I, I think that's one metric. Uh, as Red mentioned, there are many uh, metrics that are used, but uh, there's a lot of change occurring inside uh, the structure of degree programs. Uh, in some cases, it's, it involves introducing uh, opportunities to be working uh, outside the university in internships or community-based service, uh, uh, co-ops, et cetera. And that's happening in, the, in a liberal education as well, uh, not just in the profession. So, so that's one. Curriculum is a change. Two, Patrick mentioned earlier uh, the issue of outcomes and that many degrees are being designed very much now in the context of uh, what are the outcomes one can rely on and expect of a graduate coming out of that particular program. And in order to go through many quality assurance processes, those outcomes have to be clear and stated up front. Where the academy is moving now is to be able to say, what, how do we know uh, that in fact those outcomes are being achieved? And that's a relatively new 
uh, area for, uh, for metrics uh, in, in the sector. Uh, we're testing right now in a number of, uh, of universities in this province uh, certain instruments that have been developed to measure whether those outcomes in fact are achieved in students and whether the quality assurances given in those outcomes are in fact uh, the outcome that the student receives. It's complicated. It's it, complicated. It, it, could, it could be you got a great education but you graduated in the teeth of this great recession and therefore you can't get a job. That's no reflection on the bad education you got. Your timing stinks. There, there are always uh, things beyond your control. But, right. at the, but at the end of the day, I think there's a lot of work going on inside the academy, inside programs, right at the course level, uh, to ensure that we can, A, articulate what the outcomes would be, and now, C, uh, B, going outside and saying, how, do we, how can we say for sure those outcomes have been achieved? Okay. And that's a new frontier for us. I want to pick up on Cheryl's story about the... Uh, the PhD philosophy person who's now, uh, I don't know, running some insurance company out in California or something like that, and read something. And uh, Michael Higgins, I'll get you to comment on this first. This was in The Economist magazine a couple of years ago uh, on the issue of uh, who needs a PhD. Although a doctorate is designed as training for a job in academia, the number of PhD positions is unrelated to the number of job openings. Business leaders complain about a shortage of high-level skills suggesting PhDs are not teaching the right things. The fiercest critics compare research doctorates to Ponzi or pyramid schemes. Organizations that pay for research have realized that many PhDs find it tough to transfer their skills into the job market. Writing lab reports, giving academic presentations, and conducting six-month literature reviews can be surprisingly unhelpful in a world where technical knowledge has to be assimilated quickly and presented simply to a wide audience. So the question, Michael, uh, is the post-secondary world educating too many PhDs in the humanities? <laughs> no, no, it's not educating too many. I, I don't understand that argument, and it's been advanced on several occasions by several different people, Peggy Wenty does it fairly often, that we suffer from a surfeit of uh, PhDs and BAs and MAs, and somehow there's a, there's a perfect number out there that we should be aspiring to, and we've exceeded it and we've naturally glutted the market. Pa part of the problem, Steve, comes in the phrasing of it, I think, and in, the, in not only the phrasing or the discourse, but even the framing of the argument. Um, it is, it's a largely mercantile or utilitarian argument that appears in The Economist. I mean, the, what, what we're looking at is, what, do, what is the purpose of the PhD? What is the purpose of the research degree? What, uh, the, the very notion that it expands knowledge, or is it primarily to be subordinate to one's employability? What becomes the primary or overriding feature then is its utilitarian dimension, rather than the fact that it's contributing significantly to the, to the body of knowledge, to human self-understanding. Now these things can, to some degree, be quantifiable, and I think that Bonnie is correct, that efforts to uh, find new ways, new metrices, new instruments of assessment are very important, and they're new in many ways to the academy. But also other questions, I think, are, are of greater, perhaps even more profound significance, and, and that rests around the whole notion of what the university is, in fact, for. If we see it primarily to be a holding tank or a training center or a kind of a gestational area which, we, which produces, uh, at, at a particular given time, a number of individuals who will serve the driving economy, then it seems we have, to me that we have a very narrow understanding of what the purpose of the university is. And the PhD, which is the kind of summit of the research or academic undertaking, has traditionally had very specific uh, criteria associated with it in terms of admission, assessment, and contribution. Now, it's not without uh, weaknesses or deficiencies, and, and one can look at the, well, anything from the novels of David Lodge to any number of, of works that have great fun <laughs> and take great sport at making uh, a mockery of the PhD industry. And there's some ways in which it's become an exaggerated, almost caricature of itself. At the same time, however, it is the driving force of what we mean by knowledge in our culture and in our society it has a long pedigree. Uh, more often than not, it's been tested to be of inestimable value that often can't be uh, as simply quantifying, uh, 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 or simply quantified as the economist seems to suggest. Patrick Dean, let me try this with you. If we assume that society, to be firing on all cylinders, if you like, needs a certain number of PhDs in a wide variety of areas, let me ask the follow-up. Are we graduating enough PhDs in the right areas and too many in, for lack of a better expression, in the wrong areas? 
Well, uh, part of me wants to say that the, uh, the, the question is in some sense a red herring. Uh, I, I agree with Michael that a PhD is intended to, uh, to help individuals advance the, the, the depth and the complexity of their knowledge of a particular area. Um, and that may or it may not uh, be congruent with the requirements of, of the workforce. Um, I want to go back to Cheryl's point, which I think is a great point that we've, we've, we've left behind, and that is that new kinds of degrees are appearing in the university. And uh, I think the PhD is and probably will always be what it has historically been, uh, an opportunity for someone to probe in great depth, some would argue in unnecessary depth, a particular issue. Um, uh, and th they will do that. Now, some will do that expecting some kind of career rewards. I doubt many do. Um, uh, others will do it just because of an inherent interest in the subject. Uh, Cheryl's point is the key one, I think, that the university has begun to respond to some of the needs of the, the changing labor market and the changing aspirations of students who wish to enter the, uh, the, the job market with a high level of skill and achievement in a particular area, but not the kind of uh, achievement that is represented by the PhD. So uh, I, I mean, I think it's, it just points us to a very interesting aspect of universities, which is the slowness with which we adapt to changing circumstances. And uh, we get caught in these debates, which I think are, in some sense, a sort of factitious debate, which is that um, our existing degree frameworks uh, are, are not appropriate to or insufficient for the demands of the contemporary world. Well, if we're smart, we'll be doing what Cheryl described. We will be allowing individuals like myself who want to do a PhD in, in English literature to do it. Uh, and to work on whatever career translation occurs after that. But on the other hand, uh, students with the capacity to achieve at a high level may want a course of study that leads more directly to uh, a line of work, and they're a, a, a tailored master's program, a two years master's program, whatever, whether it's course-based or uh, also includes a thesis component, this may be the way to go. Uh, this debate always seems to me to be hobbled by our assumption that the university is as it always was and always will be exactly the same. And of course it's not. The, the academy of, of our time is, uh, I suppose, a, a transmogrification of uh, a model the university created at Harvard in the late 19th century. And much of that must be retained. Uh, much of that does not to need to be defended uh, in the teeth of a sort of an instrumentalist uh, assumption about what all education should be. But similarly, we have an obligation to society, and in response to that, institutions can begin to rethink degree structures, invent new ones, rethink the old ones, in, in order to provide for our students what, what they really need and to satisfy the needs of our society. Okay, Cheryl's got a follow-up here. So I agree with everything that Patrick said, except for his uh, thought that universities are a bit slow. So <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> and in my day, when I was a graduate student, you could, if you were passionate about learning, you could do a PhD, you could go to law school, you could go to med school, or you could do an MBA, full stop. Yeah. Not, this isn't, not too many years have passed, and at the University of Toronto, we have 83 yeah, professional master's degree. So that's fast, right? These, these programs have to be envisioned, they have to be planned, they have to be put through uh, countless uh, uh, hoops of governance and through the ministry, they Are have they to well get attended? students. We have, for some of these uh, uh, spots, uh, we have hundreds of brilliantly qualified applicants, as they say, banging on our doors to get in. Do you turn so people away from these positions? We turn hundreds of people away, of students who, as I say, are coming in with astoundingly good averages. Uh, I, I've actually just um, put uh, uh, a lot of money uh, on the table for four of our most successful professional master's degrees uh, and asked them to double their enrollment uh, next year, just because we, we, we literally will have 600 uh, applicants for one spot. What's the program? Master of Public Policy, 
uh, has uh, almost 100% uh, placement rate, maybe 100%. For September of next no, year? No, placement. That, this is, these students are graduating into fantastic, oh, okay. meaningful, wonderful jobs. Um, master Public Health. There's a very good uh, engineering uh, master's program that uh, just has is overwhelmed with uh, with applicants. But I'm curious, and, what about uh, you? Go off and you run a hospital, or you go off and you become a deputy minister, or what's what's the path once you've got this degree? Uh, master public policy. Yeah. Various. I mean, uh, countless different paths, right? So there are streams within the the master's degrees. Um, this, this particular degree, but students are going off, graduates are going off into all sorts of, uh, as I say, wonderful, meaningful work. Okay, having said that, having said that, I want Richard Lawhorn to come in here and follow up on that because The Economist magazine, which admittedly may have a bit of a, you know, a slant on this issue, reports that 80% of postdoctoral graduates in this country, Canada, earn less than $40,000 a year before taxes. Now, if that's true, Richard Lawhern, are people getting value for those three very fancy letters? Uh, value is one of those things that's really hard to metricize. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not to be not to be ironic about it, but let's let's try to address the question. And to add one more, I would offer in as a follow-up to the point just made that one of the things that significantly distinguishes the new programs emerging in professional degrees is that they have changed the educational model in a very fundamental way and that and the way they've changed it is they have taken out of the path of stakeholders the students the primary barrier to their advancement after graduation and that is the requirement to create something substantively new in the field in a thesis or dissertation paper. That one requirement stands in the way of graduation for people who are already admitted in a very large proportion of the programs which still cling to that model. So in part I applaud the emergence of professional degrees because they do from a utilitarian point of view, from the economist point of view, they do a better job of giving people the intense and deep knowledge of a field of learning that is necessary for them to, to do something in the employment world. But as far as uh, generalizing or broadening the, the, the question earlier asked, uh, I, w I admit to being rather uncomfortable with the lingering uh, evidence that the educational model itself is profoundly flawed, especially at the PhD level. It's not a question of matching people up to the number of jobs available. It is a question in part of not taking people's tuition money for a degree that they will never get and not exposing them to, if you will, a lot of what might be called highfalutin thinking that never gets to the level where it can be translated into something that's meaningful in, in their daily lives. I'm probably wandering a bit on topic, but uh, that, that one bothers me a lot because I think the emergence of the professional programs in a way are an acknowledgement that the classic educational model of the late 19th century flat doesn't work and very often operates very much against the interests of those who participate in it. $40,000 a year is not a lot of money for somebody who has just spent seven years in research, which can happen very frequently and does in the technical fields, often operating with practically a, a minimal standard of living. You're never ever going to catch up with that in career results. It won't happen. Okay, we've got some feedback here in the studio to that. Bonnie and then uh, Cheryl, please. Well, in fact, if you look at Stats Canada data, I think you can't just look at a snapshot of earnings on graduation. But you have to look as a snapshot of lifetime earnings. And there's no question that the data would support uh, our PhD graduates and our master's graduates, in fact, are earning far more than uh, individuals who pursue an undergraduate degree uh, or, in fact, not a degree at, at all. At what point in their life? Uh, well, it, it is actually within a five year period out where you see very large jumps in the salary that PhD graduates hold. The other side of it, and again, we're talking about multiple metrics in, in this area. Uh, we, we really only produce about 30% of our PhD graduates to come back into the academy. 
70 uh, percent of them actually go out into either government uh, research areas, uh, lab, lab work for example, or uh, go into the private sector. So if you also look at what unemployment rates are for these individuals in Canada, if you look at PhD data, it would suggest that it's under 4%. Uh, and that's not bad in, in this kind of economy. So I, I think we have to be careful about sweeping generalizations. Most importantly coming out of graduate studies is the passion for discovery. Uh, and, and whether it's on a more applied side or a hugely theoretical side, uh, whether it's, it's the new story uh, created in discovery research or whether it's more on the innovation end of, of uh, more pragmatism in, in, in the outcome of that degree, I, I think there's for sure value that can be measured in a number of metrics. Cheryl? Sure. I agree, and we also have to be careful not to be too paternalistic with respect to uh, our young people. So when I was applying to graduate uh, schools in philosophy, the job market was even worse than it is today. And uh, the American Philosophical Association required every graduate school in philosophy to send all applicants a letter that said, glad you applied to Columbia, uh, you had better be applying for a PhD in philosophy uh, for some reason other than that you want a job in philosophy, because there are none. Mm. And uh, we all took hard looks at uh, those letters and took uh, deep breaths. And if you were from uh, a working class family as I was and you had your parents on your, on your back shouting at you about this useless degree that you were going to get, you, you made these decisions for yourself. And, uh, and to suggest that our young people um, shouldn't be uh, able to make these decisions for themselves these days because of, I'm not sure what, uh, but, but of some, some changing set of circumstances uh, is, is a bit paternalistic. I want to put, um, let me put this to Michael Higgins. I want to play some tape here. This is uh, U.S. President Barack Obama. Uh, within the past couple of weeks, uh, during his State of the Union address, he had something most interesting to say about post-secondary education. And uh, I want you to listen to this, Michael, and then we'll come back with a question. Roll tape, please. Join me in a national commitment to train two million Americans with skills that will lead directly to a job. My administration has already lined up more companies that want to help. Model partnerships between businesses like Siemens and community colleges in places like Charlotte and Orlando and Louisville are up and running. Randy mentioned your city there, but I want to go to Michael with this question. When the President of the United States, in the number one bully pulpit moment of the year in American politics, comes out and so clearly connects the dots between Post-secondary education should be about getting you a job at the end of the day. If you're in the liberal arts slash university world, what do you take from that? Well, several things, Steve. <laughs> First of all, I think the applause seemed to be longer than the actual text. The president's uh, <laughs> rhetoric is in uh, full flight now, of course, because it is a, an election year. Uh, he has to um, obviously concentrate on some quotation marks and deliverables. He's not without his pragmatic side. Uh, quite clearly, the American economy is, is facing serious international competition with regard to the job market. And he's very conscious of the uh, uh, accelerated tuitions here, where it's not uncommon uh, in a middle range uh, comprehensive university where the tuition is between 43, 45,000 plus. Uh, how, how are you going to, in a, in, a, in a way, provide a workforce that's going to be uh, not largely responsible, but a major contributor to the recovery of a declining uh, economy. So there are several factors mm -hmm. that are part of the president's address. But what is interesting to me is, of course, he is uh, himself the product of a different model. Uh, he's a liberal arts graduate. He's a lawyer. He is someone who would have been educated in a more traditional way. And here he is. Um, I wouldn't say pontificating, because this is obviously a, an important political moment, but drawing from the, the richness of the tradition that has in fact shaped him. 
helped him make him the kind of uh, thinker that he is. And he is a president who has a, uh, clearly a working mind. I, just, I, want, I want to just go back, um, not because I'm, I'm trying to retread the thing or, re, or rewrite this, but I, the, the earlier um, comment uh, that, that, that struck me, again, I think it was Richard, although I, I agree with everything Patrick was saying, uh, I'm beginning to feel a bit like uh, a troglodyte here. I'm not, not, I'm not <laughs> suggesting I look like a troglodyte. That's an entirely different matter. But I'm beginning to feel a bit like a troglodyte in that I, I actually think uh, having people do some highfalutin thinking is a very good idea. Oh, yes. I think that that's oh, what yes. universities should be. I think they should be sanctuaries of the mind. I think when we bring students into this special place, particularly in a frenetic, uh, demanding, work-oriented, complex, and ever-changing, and ever uh, morphing into other realities, uh, if you like, and structures are almost uh, at, at an alarmingly accelerated and even hum inhumane rate, we need to have some constants. We need to have some uh, stability, if you like, some some way in which we can bring our students together to 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 think, to be mentored, to be tutored, to have uh, an important role to play, and then, in in, an, in a sense, not disgorge them on society, but help prepare them in, uh, to be literate, competent. Uh, agile and flexible contributors to society. And I think in many ways this, this is the fundamental question. It's, it's so often being shaped by other determinants uh, in terms of either an instrumentalist view or in terms of an immediate economic uh, benefit, in terms of the quite, I have four children myself who have gone to university. I'm not unaware of or indifferent to the anxieties that accompany uh, a, a bourgeois parent trying to figure out how to pay for their education. So I mean, there are all kinds of aspects to the post-secondary liberal arts uh, uh, iteration that do require a pragmatic response. But I think that uh, we need to do as a society some uh, radical thinking about what, in fact, university education is. And this is where I would just slightly disagree with Cheryl. I think her, her argument for the master's degrees at the University of Toronto is very good, and it's very impressive to see the Uni University of Toronto exercising this leadership in the country on this matter. But what I, I, I think uh, Patrick's point about the universities being slow to adapt is still largely true. I think that we're dealing with, in some respects, a uh, slightly tinkered with uh, healthy institution but nonetheless not wholly adaptive to the new and changing technologies and shifting mentalities of our, of our time. And I'm afraid like, like Ivan Illich, who was a, a genuine iconoclast, I'm kinda, I kind of think we're dealing with the, the new needs with instruments from an earlier time. Okay, we're a little over five minutes to go and I'm gonna ask everybody to be a little bit briefer with their responses, just to make sure we get the last few things in we wanna talk about. Uh, Patrick, I, I'm, you know, maybe you didn't think this, but I got to tell you, I bet a lot of people did think this, that when Barack Obama said that, what he was saying between the lines was, hey, you universities, we really got enough philosophy and sociology students out there. It's time that we started graduating people who could have a more immediate and important impact on the economy. I mean, did you hear him say that? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. I th I'm not sure one should assume he was talking directly to the universities there. I mean... My response to that is that um, his sentiments are uh, sentiments I would find totally uh, um, congenial to think about. I mean, I think every young person uh, should should have access to the right kind of education that will open up opportunities for them. And of course, our, our, our society does need people to get out and to, to drive the economy forward. So I, I would never quibble with it. It seems to be a completely unexceptionable statement that he made. Uh, the really problematic thing is assuming that that is the work of the universities. And, and here I think I'm a bit like Michael. I think we've I mean, people do talk about the the sort of the the shift in mandate between, say, the colleges and the universities. And uh, as funding becomes more scarce, of course, universities are being held uh, to be accountable for results, and so we we tend to be moved more in the direction of a much more instrumental view of education. But in fact, I don't think it it, it sits all that comfortably in the ethos of the university, which is not to say I don't applaud and support the direction that Cheryl was talking about, because I do think that's important. But at one level, the university must always be different from the kind of uh, system described there by the president. Um, otherwise, there'll be no new thinking, there'll be no innovation. It, it will be a, 
um, I, I don't know, there will be, we will have an economy without leadership, without originality and innovation. So okay, I'm jumping in here because we're down ahead. to a few minutes here. Uh, Richard, I, I'm sure you did not see, so I will read a little excerpt for you. Uh, an editorial in Canada's national newspaper, as it likes to call itself, the Globe and Mail, back in October. But here's what they had to say on this issue. It said, we are getting less for more. Teaching is getting short shrift. More students are graduating, but not enough are leaving school with the skills they need for success in the real world. It's time for a Canadian renaissance in undergraduate education, and it will take both timid governments and hidebound universities to get the job done. How much of that do you want to sign on to, Richard? I can, ec I can uh, relate to just about all of it, and I would point out to all of my learned colleagues the use of the term junior colleges. The president was talking about an aspect of post-secondary education that is not in your game plan. Mm -hmm. He is talking about skills education, and that comprises a rather larger market than universities and colleges. I think the less value for more paid especially down here in the States, is a very serious, very real social and economic problem. We have people coming out of school who are bankrupted by their educational debt and who cannot get a job, literally. I mean, I, I, I've heard the, the, the statistics quoted for Canadian PhDs. I, you know, trust me on this, they're not as high down here. A PhD is an active impediment to getting a job in a great number of fields here because employers don't want to pay that rate. Hmm. Uh, Bonnie, on the issue of the Globe editorial. Well, you know, th there's no question that institutions are changing within. Uh, and I go back to the number of universities that in all of their programs are re-examining elements of their curriculum. So for universities, yeah, there's change. There is a, there is a bit of a, a direction around experiential learning, and, and that's evident in many program areas. But we also have a very interesting situation in, in this province and country around uh, where community colleges and universities come together. Is everybody chasing towards the university sector? Are colleges looking and taking up the mantle of advanced skill development uh, where technologies are fundamentally changing the trades, where, fu where technologies are, are uh, fundamentally changing um, the technical uh, support roles that are emerging. Uh, and, and I think there's a call uh, from the, the President of the United States to for all of us to be thinking about uh, some pragmatism in, in this particular time. Cheryl, it doesn't mean we throw out the rest, though. But a minute and a half, Cheryl, it's, uh, you know, the last line here, will take both timid governments and hidebound universities. Those are not necessarily very appealing adjectives that are put on those two institutions, no. which raises some questions about whether whether you guys can get this job done. What do you so, think? So uh, we aren't hidebound, and we are getting the job done. 83 professional master's uh, degrees. Uh, don't get me wrong. It's not that I think that we should be shepherding all of our students into these degrees. But they're there for those who want it, and a lot of people want it. Uh, but also, uh, when you talk to undergraduates, uh, it's very interesting. They know how brutal the economy is. And they are as passionate about their philosophy courses, as passionate about their English courses as I was or Patrick was way back, <laughs> back then. And, and we need to also be responsive to that, uh, not just the market. We're responsive to the market, but we also need to be responsive to our students' passion. Okay. Patrick got the best compliment, but your school's my alma mater, so you get the last word. Uh, Richard Lawhern in Charlotte, North Carolina. Michael Higgins, uh, New York City. Patrick Dean in Hamilton, Ontario. It's great of all three of you to be there on the line for us for our discussion today. Bonnie Patterson from the Ontario Council of Universities and Cheryl Misak from the U of T. Thanks so much to you two for being here as well. My pleasure. Thank you Thanks very much. Too. Thanks very much. Thank Steve. you. Thank you. They're wonderful. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.